Hello, Gary. Hello, Guy. How are you? Well, I'm I'm sort of washed with numbers, you know. I'm a wash with with platinum albums and and Grammy awards and MTV awards. And I, I mean, a hundred and fifty. But enough million. about you. Yeah, enough about me. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Someone, please dust them all. Uh, um, one hundred and fifty million records Aerosmith have sold. Um, uh, Twenty-five gold albums, eighteen platinum, twelve multi-platinum albums. Um, they hold more certificates, certifications, but um, than any other American group. I mean. That's amazing. And they were 150 not out against the West Indies. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but I, I feel that, um, in a way, they are to rock and roll what the Harlem Globetrotters were to basketball. Uh, that's an interesting way of putting it. I, because I remember I saw them. They're one of the first bands I saw in uh, Reading in 76 or 77. And do you remember there was that thing where there were those... Ameri Kiss kind of had this, not quite, this thing of American rock bands that was really cool and exotic. but And they used to play Hammersmith Odeon type places, but you they never really locked into the thing over here. Whereas, of course, in America, it was all vastness. And where do you think all that, all those layers, where did that first come from? You know, layers of the shirts, the multi-shirts, yeah, the jackets. I don't, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it was a, some sort of weird attempt to, to be rock and roll and keep warm. But do you think it was Keith? I think I think Keith did that. I tell you what, I it's, think, yeah, it's, Keith, it's yeah, like the lounging, scarves. It's the scarves. lounging around in the south of France, making Exile on Main Street, right? And and it's this idea when the shirt's all undone, it's this idea that you've just crawled out of bed and you're not quite going to get it together to to fully button everything up, and you're a little chilly because you've got no body fat, so you need multiple layers, <laughs> right? So I, that's I, I, right. That's, That's no offence to anyone who dresses like no, that. No, no, absolutely. But I was saying, but it gets to the point where, like, if you look at Johnny Depp on the Hollywood Vampire stuff, it looks like that kit takes hours to assemble. I mean, it's like getting, it's it's like getting to dressed up for a scene in Game of Thrones or something, or Pirates of the Caribbean. Well, but there, I, I've missed an open goal there, didn't I? <laughs> you really did. <laughs> um, but listen, I mean, they've got he Joe, Joe's got this. Joe Perry's got this uh, band with Johnny Depp right now. And that's but, I think, which is so, which we're going to start with, which is so star-studded. It's it's nuts the the people they've it is they've, and the, they've and the wonderful and, and the wonderful Alice is in it too. Uh, well, I love Alice. Good, a friend of the Rock on Tours. He really is. Let's and produced by oh. another friend of the Rock on Tours, Uncle Bob, Bob Ezrin, of course. Yeah. Let's get him on. Welcome to the Rock on Tours. Okay, guys, I'm ready. But it's a big tune for sure. I actually wrote that originally for Tina Turner. Of course, I had gone and found Joni Mitchell down in Florida and brought her back. I've listened to a few of them and they've been really good, man. I've been sitting in the back of the car coming into London. They're brilliant. Thank you guys for still being around, still making music, still being into it, and doing this podcast. It, it's uh, it's fabulous. Well, I get the feeling that us three should go for a pint. That's what I think. I'm in a band now. <laughs> it's called Roxy Music. You know this thing about the 10,000 hours of experience? Oh, yeah, so you it's, 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 get good at something. When we recorded Arnold Lane, we'd done about 50 hours. The Rock Hunters podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. Keep on rocking! Ah! Joe, hello. Hey. Hey, Joe, this is Gary. And I'm Guy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Guy. What's up? Joe, I wanted to start by asking you if you remember something, um, which is, do you yeah. remember back in, I think it was 1999? Yeah. Uh, a a fundraising gig that Pat Cash put on at the Café de Paris in London where you played with Stephen and Jimmy Page and the Robinson Brothers. Do you remember? Yeah, now that you mentioned it, it comes crystal clear. I was playing bass. You're kidding. Wow. At the Café de Paris. Okay. It sounds familiar. I wish I could say I remember, but I don't. Guy was playing bass. I was playing bass, but uh, the thing is that I did a... Start a comedy show for years and I used to end, which was just me telling stories and playing bass and I used to end it every night with the words I said to you on stage which is still one of the most embarrassing things that have ever happened to me which was we were playing Heartbreaker and I was just in heaven with Jimmy Page you were just playing Heartbreaker it was heaven and you leant over to me and said hey man you really know how to play this shit and I was so flustered and flabbergasted and flattered that rather than saying, you know, hey, man, I'm down with this shit or something, I went all English and I said, thanks awfully. 
I like that though. I've, been, uh, I've spent enough time. <laughs> I've got enough English friends, and you know, even back then, and I, I, I got it. But I probably only heard the awful part. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. You know? That's why you've erased it from your memory. <laughs> okay. Wait, wait. Where are you based, Joe, uh, at the moment? Uh, we, we're at our, uh, I'm at our home uh, in Florida, and uh, we live on the on the west coast, down uh, the southern part of Florida. Guy, who are you saying who else lives down there? Brian, way? Brian Johnson lives in the York. Yeah, so ex Brian lives probably, uh, as the crow flies, probably less than uh, two miles from here. Um, Robin Zander lives about, like I guess, about an hour and a half drive north. And uh, one of my neighbors is uh, Jimmy from the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. He lives like uh, oh, wow. a couple of blocks up up the up the uh, coast here. You know, I mean, I could probably hit him with a spear gun from uh, from here. <laughs> don't don't do that. Oh, would you? No, <laughs> no. I mean, I have one, but, but, but I haven't I haven't used it in a long, long while. But anyway, it's the only reference of uh, distance I could that really came to mind at, at the moment. But anyway, I think it's, a baseball. But is it, uh, but it like, is a it is a recognized unit of distance. Or, or is, I, it, how, it, I could I could throw a cricket bat at him and maybe <laughs> be, be, a, be a couple of feet short, you know. But anyway, well, that's too awfully, you know. Um, but what a, I mean, why, you must be getting together in the local bar. I mean, there would have been a time, surely, when you know, if the roadies would have got all the gear down and you would have formed the bar band. Well, you know, we've we've talked about it. I, this, my wife and I have lived down here off and on, pretty much for twenty years. And before that, I mean, she's had family here, so we've been coming down here quite a lot. And uh, and we just happened to uh, to uh, move into this neighborhood, and that's when I discovered he. So we've, we've we've been you know friends now for the last couple of years, um, but there are starting to be more and more clubs, a lot a lot of live music down here, and a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of musicians, a lot of guitar play, all all kinds of you know, players down here, and uh, you know it's one of those places. It's kind of like uh, it's very arty. There's a couple of uh, art colleges. There are, I mean, there's blues clubs and, you know, all kinds of things. And, uh, but I, I've kind of, uh, when we get home, kind of like stick close, you know what I mean? The most of my plan is, is down in my studio and, uh, yeah. So I'm always looking forward to the next show and that kind of thing. Are you like, are you like, I, I don't know about you, but I, I, I don't like seeing bands cause I'm always like, I want to be on stage. That's that's you know I'm sort of frustrated because I'm so inspired by what's going on. I want to get on. Are you a bit like that, Joe? Well, yeah, and most of somebody that you know, obviously that I know, or uh, you know, and then you know, there's the inevitable yeah. you want to come and sit in. But there's, you know, I mean, if more more likely to go out to some other kind of live entertainment if we're going to go out, you know. Uh, but again, if it's somebody that we know or somebody that we're interested in seeing, we'll we'll, we'll go out. But I think that that but uh, Jimmy, the uh, the drummer, have, and I have talked about uh, getting together and playing a little bit. It just hasn't happened. He's leaving, and I think tomorrow for a ten ten day run with his band, and I'm kind of gearing up for this uh, solo. Hollywood project. vampires. No, actually, I'm going out for a couple of weeks with with uh, the guys. Is from, it the project? Yeah. Is it, is, is it the Joe pro, jo, the Joe Perry oh, project? Wow. Yeah, we're going to do. Oh, two. we thought we thought you were the vampires was what was happening. Well, that's happening. That's after that. I guess when I get back from the 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 uh, the solo thing, I've got a couple of weeks off, and then we pick up the uh, the vampires. So you know, after after. Uh, that run in Las Vegas, you know, we've just been kind of uh, chilling out down here, and uh, you know, I know it's going to get hectic. How was Vegas? It's a it's a whole different thing. I mean, we're being musicians. You guys know, you know, like they they pay us to travel. They don't pay us to play. The travel is what really eats up the time and the, the those those travel days, and uh, which are not days off, as you know. Uh, there's yeah, there's all absolutely. that and. Uh, and then, you know, of course, when you get shows that are back to back, somewhere in there, you better travel unless you're lucky enough to do two in one one place, which is happens once in a while. But 
So it's that's, really that's the greatest luxury of all, isn't it? Yeah. These days. And I think that the, <laughs> but being able to but playing in Vegas, it was one of those things where it carried that thing about like, well, this is kind of like the last stop vibe. Uh mm. this is uh people stay there and that's all they do. Um kind of a these are broad yeah. statements here. I mean, you know, there are. Well, it's, it's sort of changing. No, but I know slightly. what you mean, but it's like, a, it's like a weird purgatory, isn't it? All these people who are there just to service this thing. That's not, it's not like you're doing a residency in New York where you're in New York, you know? Yeah. Well, the thing I, is, I, I, and it's transient. Every, everyone there is just passing through. Everyone's either on holiday or that. They, they say that, that the, the bulk of the people, um, it changes three, every three and a half days. Of course, you know, in Vegas, they get, they get all the numbers down, you know, like uh, just how about the casinos and the gambling. And, and that's why they have the, the entertainment. A lot of people just go and they, they're they not real gamblers. And there's so much to do there. So it's kind of a one of those destination places that's entertainment oriented. So uh, there aren't too many places you can do a kind of a residency like that and have yeah. the kind of uh, whole houses that, that you might. The, the most important thing, again, from from our point of view, is that once you set up your show, you can do things through production with lights and things like that that give you a, like a exactly how you would like it uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. as a performer. Better lights, better better whatever. But the bottom line is, when we went in, we said we have to we have to keep the the live like twenty uh, percent unknown aspect of a uh, Aerosmith show going in there. We can't, you know, there were suggestions like, well, you could play three songs and then you could, you could talk about those songs and how you wrote them. And then, then you could play three more nah. songs. And we said, no, that, I mean, that was shot down right from the, the right the, from the start. The blue we army said, aren't going to have that, right? We said, once we play, <laughs> once we start playing, it's a rock and roll show. I mean, we can, yeah. we can dress it up and put like, we have, the, but, but we I, have the original I, van. I, that the band rode around in when we first got together. We found that out in the woods and had it had it refurbished. Wow. And it's in the lobby. So like when you walk in, you see this van that's literally the van that we rode around in. It was a, like a little step van, like a UPS truck that our roadie had. And uh you that's know amazing. we filled up the back with gear and we all rode in the front and I, we put thousands of miles on that sucker. So that's in the lobby. So it's kind of like you're entering Aerosmith land for those, uh, for that show. And, and there are elements from the different art, art, co the, the covers and uh, of the albums and things like that. But when we start playing, it's a rock and roll show. And, you know, we're not, it's not choreographed. There's none of that. It's, it's a rock and roll show and it's different. Yeah, every night. I, I think, I think you, you can do it probably more than anyone can because part of the secret of Aerosmith's career has been taking on a medium like MTV, which, which absolutely step changed your career overnight. And, uh, and then even having a, a, a going and having a ride at Disney world, you know, having your ride built for you, there's been this kind of heightened reality about the existence of Aerosmith, you know, that is full of pizzazz and old fashioned show business, even though at the core is, is great playing and rock and roll. Well, so I think you can take on Vegas. We've really, and we had to fight for that. Jesus. I remember we would, Stephen and I would go at it about having a ballad on the record, you know? Uh, but you know, one of the things I liked about ballads is, you know, you get to, to go out of your wheelhouse, at least for me to play a different style of, of guitar, you know? And, uh, and open things up with, you know, tonally and, and trying different things to to help the song carry the carry the day. So, um, yeah, you know, we've always been like saw ourselves as a hard rock band, but we always had trouble kind of like I, it used to drive me crazy when we'd go in a record store and we'd find ourselves in the heavy metal bin. Uh, I know we have songs that would qualify, but. Certainly, that's not the majority of our stuff. We're just a rock. Yeah, you're, you're a rock. You're a rock and roll band, right? And and that that yeah. said, it's it's brought, but the, the diversity of the kind of songs that we would do it brought us into different. If I hadn't, you know, tried to to go in the that kind of funk direction, I never would have fooled around with the walk this way riff, you know. Um, 
sure. and look where that led. So those are the kind of things that we've always, uh, you know, there's, we're always willing to try everything, you know, I mean, whether it's, uh, I'm going to use. Well, I'd, I'd say like, yeah, sweet emotion, friends. I would say it's like real, has got real psychedelia tinges to it. Yeah. I mean, there's that. And, well, and dream on as well. Yeah. And, you know, Stephen came to the band with that riff and we watched that develop. We were lucky enough to have a, we found a piano out on the street and dragged it up to the apartment. And uh, the, the strings that worked, the keys that worked were just enough for him to flush the song out musically. And then, uh, and he had the lyrics and it was, uh, Jesus, it was, it's one of those songs. I mean, we must have played it at every show. And, it and which worked. part of the hotel in Vegas is that a piano in now? That piano, I wish I, wish I knew. <laughs> I mean, it probably was, you know, it went to the dump like so many of those other old, old yeah. ones. But uh, anyway. Um, but who were the bands? I mean, obviously the Stones were there for you, but at the beginning, I mean, people forget how far you guys go back. 1970, you're forming. I think 73, the first record. And But it was it people like the Jay Giles Band. I mean, who were, who did you, and Alice, obviously, who, who were you wanting to be, Joe? I think we wanted to be us. I mean, we heard, I mean, we were obviously influenced by, I think I would say the, between, between you and me, I always wanted to be in the Yardbridge and Fleetwood Mac. Yeah. I, I think I wanted to be Peter Green, but I couldn't sing <laughs> or I didn't, you know, I mean, I didn't think I could sing. And, uh, but I always, but I, I remember turning down a chance to see the Stones to go to see Fleetwood Mac. And I've got the chance to see them probably eight or 10 times. Um, I was wow. at, at the wow. tea party when they recorded that famous live record. It's a uh, four, four record set and it's got them, you know, cause they, they would, a lot of bands would come to Boston before they would go to New York. They would, come to Boston to warm up kind of that's right. Play some that's gigs, right. Yeah. And then, yeah. uh, and then go to New York, which is, you know, they wanted to, to get, get over jet lag and get warmed up and get a feel for an American audience. And then they would go down and that, and <laughs> we just Mac, did the same. We wouldn't had, had a real, uh, you know, they loved being in Boston. I remember that they were there probably for two or three weeks, kind of like the house band, um, rehearsing wow. and so that's why they that they ended up recording that brilliant piece of uh piece of yeah. uh, of work you know recording those shows so i would say that it was always about somewhere between the eye birds and Fleetwood mac it was uh touchstones for me anyway i know that we were... you know what's fascinating what's fascinating is that you look at aerosmith and you think none more american than aerosmith and yet the influences are all British bands from the sixties. Those beat bands, you know. Yeah, those were the bands that, that were we were interested in. I mean, the band that, that Tom and I had before, you know, Aerosmith. We would cover, try, try and cover, you know, like songs from Live at Leeds, uh, songs from oh, yeah. you know, uh, as good as you can in the garage, so to speak. But uh, you know, those are the, the, the you know. I remember working on the. Uh, on the uh, warming up for the the gig at the at, at uh, Max's Kansas City, we were locked up in our hotel as a, the house band there for two weeks, and every day we would be in the in the in our rooms uh, listening to Machine Head, you know. Um, oh, right. So we were yeah, Deep Purple. extremely influenced by the, the 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 English, the Second English Invasion, you know, and. Uh, and the thing is, when we were we were kind of like looked at like the the young upstarts in Boston because Jay Giles to this day I have to say was one of the most exciting rock and roll shows I've ever seen. It had nothing to do with fucking you know staging lighting nothing. When that band got yeah. going, it was and they were they were like again the ho the the house band the hometown boys. Peter Wolf had a a radio show up in the back at the tea party and they would be they would be broadcasting from there and then they would well, jay giles the drummer and the bass player would start off they'd do a few songs and then another then seth would come up on the keyboards and magic dick would come up with the with the harmonica and then peter would come down right after doing his radio show and they blew the 
doors off the place. I mean, they oh, learned God. how to put on, an, you know, he, they listened to, to James Brown. They listened, they watched The Best Showman, and they took it to another level. So we had a tough time getting any kind of notice because we were like, who are these guys trying to look be like an English band? These kids. The Giles band rules the roost, man. And I think that's one of the reasons why we were able to break in Detroit faster than we did in Boston because Detroit, Rock City, loved Jay Giles. They were from Boston, and not that many rock bands came from Boston. Boston was known as like a, a folky kind of acoustic blues kind of kind of town, being a college town. Right. And uh, when they heard of this new band, Aerosmith, that came from Boston, they gave us an extra listen, and we conquered just Detroit before we did Boston. Well, it's like, like, Alice, like Alice Cooper, right? It's the same, isn't it? The same thing, that blue-collar audience. That yeah, definitely. Took to definitely. Yeah. And the um, thing is, Alice moved to L.A. right away and became a member of the, of the Hollywood Vampires Drinking Club, whereas we stayed oh. in Boston and probably saved our lives. So, uh, you know, <laughs> and that's why that, that record, that first Vampires record, was a salute to all the guys that have died that used to be in the drinking club. So, you know. Dead drunk friends. Yeah, because you were talking about how, because you you mentioned Max's Kansas City, because that was your big showcase, wasn't it? That right. That was the thing that you. Yeah, we went down to, three times to, to audition, and we got passed on twice, and the third time was the charm. And uh, I can remember that show. We were doing the sound check, and the guys in the New York Dolls came to watch us and they would they had actually signed to the same management company a week before we did so they were the they were the the new york version and they they were like the media loved them they, they were calling them the next rolling stones and we were like this you know band from the sticks so uh fortunately were you friends with them well i got i got to be friends with them because actually after that show where we were uh where we won the, the record deal, um, we went down to see them play on their stomping grounds, you know, and they were, they were like, I thought they were fucking great. I always loved the, the punk, the, that, that, that kind of music, that garage music. Yeah. And they yeah, were the, yeah, yeah. they were great. And they, like I said, they had the, the media in their back pocket. And uh, I only bring that up because my first proper professional gig, was playing for Sylvain Sylvain. Wow. I uh, I toured Europe with him. Yeah, I, I, I adored him. He was a lovely, wonderful, wonderful uh, man. David, David Johansson actually, I think, sang with He's you. Once, yeah, he, he sang did. with you and you wrote with him, didn't you? Yeah, we came, he came up to the house a couple of times up in Boston and we hung out together. I got to be good friends with, with David and still am. I mean, he's on, he, he sang on what, three, four songs on, on my new solo record and uh, we're, we're still buddies, you know. Um, in fact, he's got a documentary right. coming out soon that, that Martin Scorsese did. I think it's Martin, and uh, but it's a it's either him or his son. I'm not sure, but anyway, he's got a documentary coming out. Uh, heads up on that. But in the meantime, yeah, David and I have you know kind of he's one of those guys like uh, Broadway Danny Rose. As soon as he steps off the cement of Manhattan, <laughs> he's he's a little funky. You know what I mean? But. I saw him in a club in the village sometime in the early 80s. And he had this sort of lounge persona. It's called Bix Beiderbeck or something. Right. It, uh, he, was just, Buster, he was doing lounge songs. Buster, yeah. Buster, Buster, Buster Poindexter. That's it. Yeah. Poindexter. So he's, yeah. he's, but, but, he's a, he's a, he, his, I love this. And his wife, they're great. They're just great. You're pulling people. together some, some influences here that I can, re I'm beginning to picture this. So obviously you've got the hard rock of, you know, of, of Jay Giles' band. But there's also this glam thing that's starting to happen, isn't there, with New York Dolls and, and, and Alice. Right. And, and really, you want the ultimate guy, right? And the, that's gonna, that if you were to put that together and make the Frankenstein's monster of the greatest person that could ever be the lead singer, it would be Steve, right? It would be Steven Tyler, right? I mean, he, he, he's, so, he's, he's the greatest in that style that you could want. Yeah, well, he definitely, us hooking up was like, I mean, he was, he, like he says, he grew up under his father's piano. He was a, he was a piano teacher, a Juilliard graduate. Uh, so he learned and was exposed to a lot of great music. And, you know, he, he his, his instrument is drums. And originally, I wanted, wow. you know, that really quick story. He, he, we had heard 
through a good friend of ours who was actually was Bonzo's drum tech for a short while that the Jeff Beck <laughs> for a short while the Jeff Beck was <laughs> Jeff Beck was looking for a new lead singer because Rod had left and oh, yeah. and Stephen wanted to try out so he asked me and Tom to back him up our band to back him up on a song so that he could send him a demo tape so that's when I finally you know got got down to music I had met Stephen here and there but and then, then after we recorded it, we jammed, even playing drums and me playing guitar, obviously. And that's when we kind of realized that, you know, we got two different people, people coming from two different ends of the spectrum. He was a fanatic about making sure things were in tune. And I was a fanatic about what's tuning, you know, um, <laughs> it's let's fucking turn up and rock out. And he realized but that's so funny what you say from what you say and especially with you know you know you're you're on the greatest guitarists list and all that is that one would assume it was the other way around yeah well he was <laughs> fanatic about about that stuff and you know like like learning the scales and practicing and practice and we were all about energy and and throwing it i mean we caught we not only covered english bands you know but also the mc5 uh, anything yes. that had, you know, that was loud and fast, that's what we wanted to do. I mean... Well, it's when, original punk. It's what punk was originally, right? Right. And, and uh, anyway, so that that's that's what it was. And he realized that it wasn't all about, like, technique. It was about energy and rocking out. And, you know, and I think... And what I saw in him was the guy could play drums like nobody. I mean, and also sing. And uh, originally, we were talking about him being a, a singing drummer. Uh, Guys that can that, that, that sing and play drums always have the best drum sound because they get that vocal mic right up there and it picks up the snare drum really well. And it's anyway, he was the whole pack. Yeah, but it yeah. never looks right. It never looks. Oh, right. I don't know. Le Le leave on helm. I mean, oh, Don Henley. Helm. Okay, leave on helm. Uh, Don Hen No, I don't know. I mm, okay, maybe it's just there's a bunch. Yeah. Of, there's a, there's some guy. I mean, rare earth. I mean, there's a lot of a, 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 a few of them. But you're right. I mean. Uh, and he had done both. He had, I'd seen him just be a singer and I'd, in, in the different bands that he had. And, you know, and he said, I'm just tired of fucking around with drums. The, the, the stuff keeps breaking. I have to, like, you know, spend an hour with Gaffer's tape, you know, and wire, getting the drums to stay together for every show. I'm tired of fooling around with that. I, w I just want to sing. So I said, fine. I, we just did audition this kid in uh boston joey kramer and um and oddly enough they had got they went to the they lived in the same town in, in uh in new york and uh so anyway that's that's the, the thing with steven that we saw in each other that each of us didn't have where you're right guy is steven was too beautiful to not be at the front of yeah. the stage right? I mean, <laughs> the, the thought the thought of steven tyler playing drums and singing yeah. is just <laughs> the, the wrongness of it's, that image you know it's just i mean again that part of it that's it but i'll tell you this one song that is actually the, the only way we i would do it is if he played drums on it and that's a song called something and it's on our last studio album uh the the one uh where we said, well, let's just throw everything on it that everybody has lying around and i had this song that they had written again called something uh and i said steven you have to play drums on it so that's one one song i can Great. point out that you'll hear his drumming he does he flipped out roles that, that go from you know that sound like wrong but they're perfect those kind of things um he's mm -hmm. he's a great drummer you know i mean uh i don't know he's telling him listen man you should you should keep those chops up it's hard enough to get him to do vocal exercises you know to get that anyway um but yeah the, the the two opposites you know is what made it happen and then we i learned a lot from him you know about songwriting that kind of thing uh that, that little piece of, of work and uh and he learned a lot about like just letting it go you know and, when did uh, you when did you two start to to write to write significantly together was that it was during the second the, kind of in the first album but i we didn't really 
it didn't i mean i i, I wrote some of the riffs on that record but he already had songs from his band from bands from before but definitely the second record is when we i have a very clear image of him because we would he would play the drums um because he would come up with these really cool rhythms and it would uh, it would inspire me to just keep riffing you know and uh and then you'd have a mic there and you'd kind of like uh you know scat along with it and then that would be the like same old song and dance is a perfect example of uh i can remember the room we did that in where he, he was sitting with the drums with the little with the microphone and an amp and you know we recorded it on something and that was that's one that, that i feel like it was the start of of that layer yeah so to speak you know, but in order to in order to get to do your second album did you had to like convince the label and go on this really really grueling endless building up an audience sort of touring around didn't you so i would have thought so you must have been for, for a band that kind of fresh to be to be used to honing your songs that much is quite unusual. well 80 percent of the bands that you that, you, that, that are the rock bands probably went through the same kind of thing i mean they're the general it's a general statement but yeah you you had that's that's when playing live was everything you know it was before mtv i mean we did mm -hmm. we did some videos for the record company for promotion that they would show at their annual meetings whatever the fuck but you know we really didn't it was all about playing live and that's when the competition of being on the same bill with other bands became very touchy sometimes um the english bands which we were like we were welcome with open arms and very often we would get the the fuck you how much stage room do you need well 10 feet we'll give you five what band what band? who is what, the worst what, what, who is what the band? Worst? come on tell us the kinks <laughs> ah. <laughs> why and do I, we not I, find okay, that I'll, okay, hard I'll tell you to believe a quick story. so we opened oh, for yes. the kinks and they gave us literally you know like no sound check fucking five feet and and, and no lights whatever you know it was a usual shit you know what i mean you, they want to save, and i yeah, get it yeah, you yeah. know you want to save your save the lights for you you know whatever there was that st yeah. that kind of stuff and so i happened to open for them with my my band the, the project and i remember them being that way and i was making a few off-color jokes the first first night that i opened for them about not you know just kind of like jabbing them a little bit you know saying the last time we played with you guys and fought to the audience I got thrown off the tour. <laughs> no. So anyway. No, well, but you know, Ray can, Ray can be a little bit uh, serious. Well, yeah, so you know, we, we've, we've had Dave I, on the show and he's, he's the sweetest man in the world. I'm but. sure. But you know, back then it was, it was no, no, but I, I'm guessing other quarters. Yeah. Well, you know what? Yeah. Like I said, it was a different time then, you know, and there was a lot of competition yeah. between the bands. You wanted the audience to, to walk out of the show. Remembering your business. Actually, plus, you plus know? they'd only just got back into America. Remember, they'd been they'd been out for years. So yeah, well, Joe, I was have there? To say you know, some of the some of the Kinks. I mean, that that there's a live Kinks record that is probably one again one of those touchstone records. I mean, I love the Kinks. I mean, I was you know from then and I and now. Well, of know? course, you, of course, you do. So uh, I mean, Dave, you know. Dave invented that sound, didn't he? Dave invented the the, the greatest guitar riff to ever be born yeah you know, I mean, so i say sick. you know my hat's off to him i you know at this point and you know i was i was being an asshole frankly saying what i did you know um and i deserved to get get the boot so um but still oh you didn't do too badly joe joe what's the what's extraordinary <laughs> about your career and i you know is that there comes a point where you must think it's not going to happen or it's over or you know i know i know you walk away from the band at one point but you have the story of, you know, this is the greatest comeback of all time to be to be born again and to be the and to be even greater beyond. I mean, but was there a time just before that when when, you know, you thought that maybe this wasn't going to work for you? Well, yeah, because, again, we were kind of we we really didn't play in Boston. We, we weren't part of the the inner circle there. Again, like I was talking about, like Jay Giles, kind of like. There was already a kind of uh, you know a hierarchy there, and there were very few you know really bands to 
come out of there, you know. But at that point, to make it uh, any noise, we saw a lot of our friends playing in clubs in town and making pretty good money, but they were having to cover cover music, you know, and we wanted to play our music. So we would go out to the suburbs and play it at high schools and play some of the clubs off in the boondocks so that we could kind of get away with playing like half and half play some of our new songs and that we wrote and covering stuff that at least kids could dance to. I don't think we ever learned Cinnamon Girl, if you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> so uh, that said, it was kind of tough in Boston. So we had a calendar, you know, that we were, I had connections, Stephen had connections uh, from our other bands, and we just would try to keep, keep the calendar full, you know, at least for a month so we knew we could pay the rent. And at one point, we were... The calendar was pretty pretty empty, and we had also just auditioned for uh, the manager in Boston at that time, who was the biggest promoter. He brought the Beatles to to uh, Boston, and and he had a, a a venue where he brought Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix and all that. So he had a you know he was the guy. When he saw us, he wanted to manage us, and so we had his record, we his management contract in one hand. And this is, I swear to God, this is the truth. It sounds like it, it belongs in a book. But we had the, the management contract, which was thick. And we didn't know what the fuck it said, but it just said, sign here. And, you know, yeah. on the other hand, we had the eviction notice, the second one. You know, the next one is they throw you out. So, uh, right. yeah. And that, so we sat in the room and said, do we sign this? I mean, he said, you know, he'll give us a salary of $100 a week. and He's the guy, you know, so, but there was that, that moment when we sat there and we said, do we sign yeah. this? I don't know what it, you know, is it forever? Is it what we didn't know, but it was like, and so many bands back then and still do don't step back and go, listen, I should have a lawyer. Look at this. Tell me what it really says. You know? So and this it, was a mistake. Was it? And it kept us in, in, you know, with, with a roof over our heads and it worked out really well because Frank, actually had he was he was sick and he knew we, he didn't have too many years left and he's the one that introduced us to the managers in new york who had just signed the dolls and helped set up the, the gigs in at man max's kansas city because he knew all the all the all the, the players the at the agencies and all that so he knew he he, he set us up pretty well you know and he remained to the a friend until he, he passed for me. I mean, he kind of took me under his wing. But anyway, that said, it was kind of like that was one of those moments. But it was, wasn't like we were going to stop. It was like, what are we going to do to keep it going? Because we, I, we I think what I, you know what I was what I was uh, what I was talking about earlier really was also you know later on when you left the band and the and it wasn't working for you. But then there's suddenly this rebirth and and in the in the. 80s in the mid 80s you know co you know with, yeah with walk this way an old song that you that was on the toys in the attic in 75 which is incredibly funky but this becomes the thing i mean i i was living in you know we were tour i was touring with with um with span now valley and we were in america a lot of that time and just how much that track just knocked everybody out because there's this coming together of genres that was really not you never saw in america you never saw that you know the the black radio coming together with white rock. I mean, it was extraordinary. I mean, what? Tell us about how that all came about. Also, can I, I just want to make one point about that that crossover is that the track is basically just walk this way. That's the thing. There's nothing's actually been done to the track. It is it's your just, song. It's no, just they come in at the no, end. We right? we, yeah. we we re-recorded. I mean, it, the only I know that, but in terms of the sound and the feel, th that was it. Right on the same time, uh, I was hearing it from my my son's bedroom blasting out we read in rolling stone rick rubin calling walk this way proto rap and i kind wow. of got that you know and I, yeah i could see that you know i see but i see a, a direct connection between blues and, and and rap but uh that's another story but the point is is that then that followed up with a phone call and we knew that they were sampling like drum sounds for their for, to to rap over from from rock records you know you know uh, bonzo's bonzo's drum licks and yeah you know th that was pretty common when the levy breaks was a big one wasn't it yeah. huge and so that way you know and we were we were 
like again, we we're honored to to hear that that they were using that drum thing for one of this, you know, walk this way. And so Rick was the one that said, "Why don't you come in and and we're not sure it'll work. We're not sure it's going to go on the record, but you know, just come down and we'll try it." And you know, it was like uh, just one of those things, you know, a little bit outside the box. Let's try it. You know, I mean, I was fascinated with the with the simplicity of the of how how amazing rap was because it was so elemental and you could not not move to it and there were it was the same the, the lyrics were speaking to their lives just like the blues you know the early That's the blues good. players you know they, they'd be sitting in a corner and playing like that like the incredibly you know heavy rhythm rhythms so the you know you know dance. what it reminds it was almost a bit like when Andy Warhol came together with Basquiat. You know, it felt like, you know, this was a piece of cultural history that was being made in art. Yeah. And and so that that part of it was like, it was really interesting to, to, to be there and see how they recorded. And I just brought my guitar with me and, and they were going, well, we, they got it into it. And we kind of like, uh, and, and Rick said, I think we should maybe put some bass on it. There's no, it need, needs some bass guitar. and. Uh, a couple of the guys that were hanging out in the studio that were also the, who Rick was working with, teenagers were hanging out, and they, one of them said, "I got a bass at home. It's around the corner." He came back with it, and, and I put the bass on it, and that's what that flushed out the track. And that was the, the, those those kids were the Beastie Boys, and uh, ah! so it you know listen, that's great. The Lord works in mysterious ways, huh? So anyway, so that that said, you know, we weren't sure it was going to go on the record. And then uh, a couple months later or whatever, a month, Rick called and said, uh, we're going to put it on the record. We'd like to do a video with you. And uh, OK, they sent some plane tickets. We, we flew in. We were on the road, uh, had a couple of days off and we did we did the video. And when they we, that's when we first heard of the, you know, what the storyline was, which was turned out to be pretty amazing you know um it was great it was a great video what yeah. it did it was it, it and it really it was the first time it went on mtv you know what i mean and it was it worked great for for each of us for our, each of our careers but it was the first time like rap was on mtv and it yeah. broke that wall yeah. down and so like for that i Literally. mean i wish i could have planned it and said i i thought of it i didn't but to be part of it, um, it's definitely a high point in my career. And, uh, you know, I think, and, I think what's been, sorry, Joe, but no, what's okay. been incredible about, about your career is that you, you're, you, you weren't closed about bringing in other writers at times. So, you know, obviously John Bon Jovi's had a big hit as well with Desmond Child, but bringing in Desmond to, to work with you on songs, it didn't, it didn't seem to, there was no one getting sort of, you didn't feel uptight about that? You were very open to that? Well, we all were uptight about it. I mean, we were kind of, but we didn't didn't say no. You know what I mean? We we, we also had a saying like, dare to suck and yeah. let's try it. And those two things would have been our kind of like, uh, you know, bylaws, if there's anything Aerosmith lived by. Or a from the strategy card. From the very start. <laughs> and it was like, well, let's try it. You know, I mean, we... You know, we we kind of played it out like in the seventies, and and we were listen. We were, we went and we did a tour when the band got back together. We did a tour without an album. In fact, we had to buy our way out of our Columbia deal. I mean, after after making so much money for them for eight years or seven years or whatever it was, they said we owed them money, so we had to buy our way out of the deal. They didn't want to record us anymore. We had no record label. We had nothing except our fans which is huge and that that was that's why we're there you know so we figured let's let's tour let's see if we can stand each other and play together again and uh see how see what's out there and sure enough the the back in the saddle tour uh you know we did that that whole summer and played every every gig we could get and felt good about it and that's when uh we thought we'd we'd do done with mirrors which was uh Printing everything backwards was a real indicator of like maybe that's not such a great marketing plan, but you know it was kind of uh, it was. We, but you, you get the feeling that from then on, though, I just this is from Walk This Way. 
yeah. I guess it's basically starting with permanent vacation. There is this because I remember yeah. all those albums that are were fantastic. There's this feeling that like you couldn't put a foot wrong for like ten years. It's that like everything you did landed. Well, we, um, we you know? worked hard at did it. it feel, did it feel like that? Yeah, I was going to say, but I mean, it was did it feel like like the wind was with you. Well, we always felt like we had more than one guardian angel. I've always felt that about me, and I think that maybe some of that spread around the rest of the guys. I, whether or maybe it's the other way around, I don't know. I know that when Stephen and I was sitting at a party up at Lake Sunapee talking about him joining me and Tom, he was saying, he, he was thinking of like, you know, hanging it up. He had had like, you know, a bunch of different bands. They were all great cover bands and maybe they did a, had a couple of singles, but just never, never really made a lot of noise. And he was so frustrated at that point. And he was thinking about just giving it up for a while, you know, laying low and just, didn't know what he was going to do you know he was kind of at that point and uh then that's when we started but right around then is when we hooked up and we did that demo tape so he could get a gig but you know he'd never heard back about it and uh clearly jeff was on to something else and uh yeah you know it was like uh <laughs> heaven that, sent. that kind of thing was like we we thought well fuck it let's 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 go for it and uh so the, those kind of moments, you know, you look back and you go like, well, it, it's not like about there's a great plan, like a one year plan, a five year plan, a 10. It's like the next day plan, you know, and that's yeah, always yeah. been the thing. We always just tried things and let's see, let's meet this guy, Desmond's child. Let's see what it's like. But we weren't, you know, jumping up and down. Oh, Diane story. Warren, Diane Warren, you know, I mean, you took on Diane Warren as well. I mean, but, you know, you made that song your own. And I think that's always been the thing with, you know, it might be Desmond Child, it might be Diane Warren, but in the end, it always sounds like Aerosmith. Well, we tried, you know, another one was doing that movie with the Sergeant Pepper movie, you know. I mean, I like to think yeah. that we got away clean with that. We got two things. We got Yeah, chance. you're right. Yeah you, yeah, you just reminded me. You had got away with that. Yeah, we got... <laughs> who, who directed that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, and we just, you know, we, we uh, got the chance. The two hooks for us were you get to record with George Martin. The second one was you get to record with George Martin. And the third one is you get to cover a Beatles <laughs> song <laughs> with George Martin. So... Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, talk, yeah. talking of which, because we haven't got long left. Uh, unfortunately, with you, Joe, because with the because we, we need to t say a bit about because the fact talking about George Martin, you have Paul McCartney on the Hollywood Vampires album. Yeah, well, he's on the first one. I mean, what, what, what? How, how was that? Were you all in the same and room? He's, bad and company. he's playing the violin, bass, right? Bad company. I'm uh, not bad company. <laughs> bad finger. Sorry. Uh, bad finger. Bad finger. And track, and yeah. no, he came in, and you know, I guess because because Johnny had just done that. No, no. What was the hook up there? I think it maybe it was because he worked with Alice. I'm not sure who who had his number, but anyway, he uh, he said, uh, "Come on down." Uh, you know, somebody said we'd we'd do it. We're covering some songs. We want to cover uh, cover that that uh, if you want it. And would you want to come in and play on it? And he came in like. With his bass under his under his arm and uh, the bass, by the way, and, the bass, yeah, and, yeah. So the what, yeah, with the Candlestick Park set list on it, and exactly. And I'll tell you, man, it was like you, you had to like, I mean, being a one of like eighty million guys and girls that saw the Beatles on on Ed Sullivan, uh, and basically changed the course of yeah fucking life. Life, life. The amount of people we've had on this show, the life, amount of people we've had on this show, where it's it's the Beatles and Ed Sullivan. Life, that's it. That's they've changed zero. life yeah. as we know it at that point. And yeah. you know, to, you got to kind of put that on a shelf. And then he's just he's just another guy who's like, you know, who's a fucking great player, obviously. And it's not it, it, it's yeah. impossible not to have a little bit of that clicking in the back. Uh, but he spews uh, ideas. But know. he came in and he sat down at the piano and it was and he. And, and we we played we recorded it live and then then he uh he put put a bass on it bruce wickin the guy who engineered my last solo record uh played bass to fill in and then you knew paul was gonna put that on and then he he, he sang it and uh he became Fantastic. a hollywood vampire so it was so uh, let's, let's but it was let's great talk to, about to be able to talk to him and just just say 
just talk to him for a minute and say, like, I asked him, did you write that song? Like, I bet you wrote that in 20 minutes facetiously, you know? And he said, well, you know, as a matter of fact, you know, we just signed this band and uh, I knew they needed a single. So I was thinking about it in the middle of the night. I got an idea. I went down and, and comped it on the piano and recorded that. And then I then I went into Apple a day an hour before the other guys and played all the instruments, handed them the cassette, and that's the last time he ever played it till til we were doing it. Then. Is that, and no is no it, lyric sheets, no nothing. He sat down. Come and get it. Yeah, yeah. And, there, it. and yeah. there it is. And then then it was like, holy shit, you know. I mean, but it was just like just talking to, and he just he's a really amazing. Is everything everybody could say good about the genius and uh of course anyway it was uh joe great. we we uh, had uh we, we had alice cooper on this show uh last year alice is the one of the great storytellers wow uh and so this band this current lineup <clears throat> of hollywood vampires is is obviously alice and you and tommy and johnny yeah Depp. yeah and, and uh <laughs> i mean johnny actually can we just uh, we should just mention passing of jeff beck i guess because obviously yeah johnny was play was touring with him and you were close to, to to jeff as well weren't you well yeah the last few years i got a chance to to really get to know him uh you know i've been a fan since the since i heard the first uh yeah records well you said you know, the yard buds yeah you said yeah, yard yeah. Buds straight off the bat yeah. yeah so i mean it was i always heard something different from him you know what i mean he was always didn't play what you'd expect. And then, you know, the, the truth record was like, holy shit, you know, that, that record is incredibly well produced. And the, the guitar just, anyway, after he, he passed, I mean, obviously, I mean, I kind of like ran through my mind all the different times I had a chance to just shake his hand. You know, before I was, before Aerosmith, you know, when I was just another fan in the audience, which I still am, you know, and nothing's changed there. And uh, and I remember waiting for him at the stage door in Boston at the tea party, and nobody was there. I was the only person, and just another geeky kid, you know, and I, I just didn't want an autograph. All I wanted to do was shake his hand and tell him he was the best, and that was oh, it. And oh, he said thanks, wow. and that was it. And then, as you oh, know, I, I managed to see every every tour every itineration over the years and you know as time went on i got to got enough credibility to get a backstage pass you know and then uh mm -hmm. the, like the first time we played in san francisco at the at the fillmore or winterland um and i remember he was in town and somebody said hey jeff jeff's up there in the balcony and uh sure enough he was up there with with one of his guys he probably you know i looked up i saw him there and while we were on stage and then he he split uh i'm just really glad he 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 hooked up with johnny they had a great a, a great time getting to know each other and it was all about having a good time and uh, uh yeah how was, how, you how do you guys how do you guys decide what tracks you're going to do because i mean you are a barroom band aren't you cover you're a covers group in many ways aren't you i know you write your own stuff as well but yeah, you also do yeah, other people we've got an album of covers and an album of new stuff right? yeah Pretty much. well so what, what's this tour going to be because you're coming to the uk in the summer aren't you yeah we'll, we'll be playing probably the majority of stuff off the new record again it didn't we were playing playing a lot of music from it on the last the last run but this time we're really going to we're going to re-release some songs, put a video out or two, and, uh, and I would say we'll do a, a a fair amount from the from the new record, and we'll we'll cover a few of the like we'll probably do a couple of Alice's songs, a couple of my songs, oh, that that's kind of thing, right. Oh my gosh, crazy. what a night! I, you and, know? and you're being supported by the tube. Oh, Fee Wable. Yeah. Is Fee Wable playing? I mean, that's the most. I noticed you're being supported by the tubes, except in Scarborough. So, what I want to know is what went down the last time the tubes played in Scarborough? <laughs> uh, you know, who, who knows? You know, at this point, yeah, exactly. who knows? But, uh, you know, I've just been just starting to get because uh, the, the, the start dates and the end dates have been kind of uh, 
shifting around a little bit. We have a we had the, the window for this tour has been on the books for two years. I mean, that's how far out we have to book the vampires because of the, the three of us have different yeah. jobs. We all have day jobs, you know. So it's kind of. Uh, <laughs> Uh, oh, you know, it's not. It's the same with with having Gary in the band, working with an actor. It's a uh, it's a nightmare, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, it's it's that kind. Of, but then Alice is always on the road. If he's got, you know, and yeah. and or with, playing golf with, yeah. Well, he does both. I mean, that's what <laughs> keeps him going. He plays golf every day, every show day. He plays golf. I mean, he's he's Crazy. a machine. It's hard getting it all together. But when we get like a, a block of time. Then we have to fight everybody off you know it's like yeah but you sure and that's it man i don't know when we're going to play again it took two three four years what since the last tour we're just really anxious yeah. to get out and play some of the, yeah. the stuff that really represents what the band's about you know i, I love doing the, the cover record but the real we've really poured our hearts and soul into that into the, the new record it's really Guys, exciting it's going to be a rock on tours it's going to be a rock on tours night out isn't it see, it's definitely see a rock on joe and night alice out. on stage we've we well. got to come and see you yeah you know but the, uh, come see i you, feel like it's the it's the the best unknown band in the world <laughs> if i do say so but you know i mean when you got when you got four guys that, that play like that and uh, and johnny it's been interesting to see the audience reaction to johnny because it's like Obviously, I mean, the, he's such a an amazing person and draw, and what you see is what you get. He really is, you know. But he's a guitar player first. He's a musician first, and he's a, yeah, he's, he's a, a great guitar player. And, yes, there's and, no question. About and that. after the first couple songs, you know, people kind of go, "He's in the band. He's not, you know, uh, you know, he's not right. going to break into Jack. It's not Sparrow, a gimmick, you know." Uh, there's like with three different, you know, and and our, and, and and Alice is a performance artist, you know. I mean, he was yes. one of the ones that's. I mean, he's a pioneer in that shit. And you know, yeah. and the thing I, he really loves about being in the Vampires is when he's on stage with his band, he doesn't talk to the audience. He he is in character, and if he talks to the audience, he's going to break character. And in the band, and in, in the Vampires, he gets to be a rock singer and he talks to the audience and, and it's a different, a whole different thing for him. I mean, you, you can't take the, uh, the, uh, take Alice Cooper out of the, out of, you can't, yeah, yeah, yeah. Know, there's something this is, in the, this is, he's not, he's not going to be Vince. He's you, not going to be Vince. No, is no. Well, he is a little bit, but, uh, he still spends a half an hour warming up by throwing knives at the latest, uh, <laughs> latest cover of the, of the sun, you know, uh, yeah, <laughs> but um, but you know that's how he, he kind of gets warmed up. But you can't take the the, the Cooper out of Alice. So, um, but he feels like he gets to be like a, ro a rock singer in a band, as opposed to having to put on take on that persona. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Joe. Yeah, yeah. you've got to you've got to go. You, you, we've you've got to you, you, you've, you've got to you've got someone else. Joy. No yeah. problem, yeah. man. It's great talking to you guys, and uh, I hope to see you uh, over there on on your side of the pond. We you will. Oh, yeah. We 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 um. I think we might know who your PR is, and we'll we're going to get ourselves a couple of tickets, aren't we? That would be we great. Well, make sure you you introduce yourselves. You know, I mean, uh, we will. I'm Absolutely. Not, you know, uh, we'll come back. I'll come up and say thanks awfully. All right, sure, <laughs> man. <laughs> all right, all right, Joe. Thank you. All, all right. the best. Thank you so much, man. Thanks so much, man. Bye. Bye. No, I was going to say that was really good. I I love it. He was someone who really wanted to give a full answer to a question. He did, I you know, really like that, you know, which is really, really nice. And, and he, because you know, you know, this is, you know, these are ultimate rock and roll, iconic looking guys, aren't they? And yeah, he was so down to earth here and yeah. and humble, I felt, about yeah. where he was in, in and what he'd achieved and all of those things. And, uh, and what I didn't get to ask him is if, if uh, Aerosmith is going to do any more at some stage, but I'm sure th their career isn't over yet, is it? No, no. Uh, you um, ain't playing. You ain't playing bass for him anymore, though. No. Thank you no, no, awfully. I'm never, I'm never, I mean, really. Thank, thanks awfully. I know, thanks I, I, awfully. I, I just, I just became John the Measurer. <laughs> <laughs> thanks awfully. Yeah. 
Well, well, listen. Anyway, guy, thanks awfully for, for this <laughs> yeah, podcast. Uh, thanks awfully. That's how, I used to, that's how I used to end my stand-up show. Thanks, thanks, um, uh, thanks, thanks all- awfully to Ben. Thanks awfully to all you at home yeah, listening. Yeah, and that's, yeah. it's turned into Itmar or something, hasn't it? Yes. Thanks uh, awfully for everyone for and put that light out. Remember, <laughs> <laughs> it's good night from me, and it's good night from Ben. Thanks awfully. Rock on Tours is produced by Gimme Sugar Productions for Warner Music Group UK.